right, good evening. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church this evening. If you're able to, please stand and join me as we sing hymn 310, Whiter the Snow, hymn 310. tonight in near Houston, Texas, and so uh, we need to be in continued prayer for them. They start tonight, go through Sunday, and uh, uh, we ought to bathe that thing in prayer and, and uh, ask God. Of course, he's preaching there for Pastor Ellis, who used to be a member here. And so we're well invested. Uh, it's been pretty neat. It's a good church, so we need to pray for them. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that we can meet in the matchless name of Jesus Christ be able to say that he's our savior that you have cleansed us from our sin delivered us from hell given us a home in heaven and we call this prayer meeting night because we we spend a little bit of special time just giving our requests and lifting them up to thee and pray your hand would be upon the pastor out there and that you'd use him it's a, their time's a little different than ours that they'll start in a little bit and we pray that you fill them with the Holy Spirit that you uh, give them clarity of thought and use them tonight uh, that you bless this church with your power and presence and then we pray for Pastor Brent to hear tonight as he preach the word of God I pray your hand to be upon him and also that he be filled with the Holy Ghost and You'd be glorified by the preaching of the Word of God. May our time in the music be special because uh, the one we're singing about and the, the song you've given us in our hearts. Bless these few minutes together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we go to hymn 317, what a friend we have in Jesus. In 317. Oh, 
right. Well, we've got some good looking ushers tonight, so you guys can pay me later. Okay, all right. Announcements. Uh, there's no school Monday, October 23rd. Where's the young people? My teacher. We're, we're to rejoice in the Lord always, but and we rejoice when, th you know, uh, no school. And then uh, 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 Friday through Saturday, October 27th, 28th, is the couples retreat. And I hope that you'll be in prayer about that. Uh, of course, we, uh, we've we gotten to know the Jets a little bit, and we, we trust that they're going to be a blessing here. And then, of course, Brother Jet will be preaching that Sunday. And uh, so if there are no other announcements, we'll have our ushers come. We'll honor the Lord with our tithes and offerings. The the the, uh, the offering tonight goes to Bethel Baptist School unless otherwise designated. Jonathan, will you pray for us tonight, please? Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to come to your house and worship you. I pray that you would give Pastor Brent the words to speak and that we would be attentive and uh, get what you would have for us to get. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. tonight from Brother Jesse and Miss Jackie. And uh, every time I have a chance to do that, I will do that. Thank you. Um, Mark chapter 3 is where we're going to be at tonight. Mark chapter 3. Um, only a few more nights left uh, with daylight savings. Uh, do we have till when the time change? Do we stop doing the visitation on Wednesday evening at 545? So uh, only a couple more, really two weeks left. So please make yourself available for, for that so we can do that. Um, as well, on the sound booth back there, there are the, the Patriot program that we do for the veterans. That's in three weeks from this Wednesday, so there are some flyers back there as well that you can pick up and pass out as well to veterans that you know. So do remember that as well. That's in three weeks from now. Um, Pastor Jim texted me and let me know that he's praying for the service. He did ask, he did, even Pastor Mary said, pray, pray for them as well, um, for the revival work down there in Houston, uh, Missouri City specifically, so be in prayer for them. But here we find in Mark chapter 3... Um, going to be in a couple places tonight in the scripture, but Mark chapter 3, verse 1, it says here, And he entered again, um, speaking of Christ, um, into the synagogue. And there was a man that there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days? Or to do evil, to save life, or to kill. But they held their peace. And when he looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And so what we see here um, is Christ, obviously, in the synagogue, um, if we go back to Mark chapter 1, I believe it's the same synagogue here that we find in Mark chapter 1, verse 21. 
because um, when he started his earthly ministry, it was around the area of Galilee. Um, this synagogue follows um, that pattern of where we're looking at. And it says here, um, and they went to Capernaum, straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. Next time the synagogue's mentioned here is in Mark chapter 3, so I believe it says he went to the synagogue again. So I believe it's the same one. It may be a different one. That's up to you, um, how you see it. But And they were astonished. And so he's at the synagogue, and he entered the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with the unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone what we have to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth. Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And so it says here, And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him, and they were all amazed. And so much they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For what authority commandeth even the unclean spirits? And they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And so this is where Christ's ministry was picking up here in Galilee where it started. And he ended up with his disciples. Next couple verses there, next chapter 2, he calls the disciples. And we find here in verse 23 of chapter 2, came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they want, went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said to them, Have ye never read what David did? When he had need and was in hunger, he and they that were with him, how he went to the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is the Lord also of the Sabbath. Um, so you need to realize, realize as Christ was speaking, and the Pharisees, and what they were really just focused and stuck on, and what the Sabbath was meant for, that's not really anything what tonight's message is really about. But really, this, um, the message is really about why are we so stubborn. Um, and we see the Pharisees stubborn about this, about the Sabbath. And it's really unfortunate, because as you see here, man, we weren't made on the Sabbath. Man was created on the sixth day. And so man was not made for the Sabbath. Man wasn't made to be lazy to work. Um, the Sabbath was a privilege and a blessing given to man to allow us to rest. And so what Christ was referring to is that what the Pharisees made it into was a drudgery and a horrible thing to go through. So why are your disciples plucking corn on the Sabbath? Um, it's really interesting because Christ doesn't really bring up the Sabbath to them until later. He actually brings up, well, what, look what David ate. Because um, the Pharisees, interesting enough, if you do study it on the Sabbath days, they really didn't do much except make sure they ate very important food. Uh, it's very interesting if you do the, the look and read that. And so he lets them know that David ate your food too. And he wasn't a priest. And so he's trying to teach a lesson here. And it comes down to their pride and what they're stuck on. And we're in charge and we're going to do this. Because they were the ones that were in charge. Because you find here in Mark chapter 2, Christ spoke with an authority greater than theirs. And that's why when you go to a service where a man of God preaches, and he doesn't say, I hope this works well or does this, but he preaches with authority because it's given by God. Amen. Amen. And it's the Word of God. From the Word of God. Not the Word of God coming out of his mouth, mind you. It's from the Scriptures, the Word of God. But there's authority behind the preached Word of God. That's the power that God gives to preach the Gospel. And so there's the authority behind it. Christ being the Word of God, had that authority. Um, someday we're going to hear him speak in heaven. Um, it's, it's so unfortunate that several individuals who actually heard Christ speak but did not believe but actually got to hear the Word speaking is an amazing thought. And that's why there's such authority and such doctrine. And that would be something that someday we get to actually sit at his feet and hear him talk to us. And that's going to be a great time and a great day.
But we see here that later on with the Pharisees, and still argument, does he show up to the synagogue, and this man with the withered hand, and this stubbornness that, hey, this is something good, healing this man. He, Christ even says here, to save life, or to even kill on the Sabbath day. Later on, does he even tell the, the Pharisees, if you had an animal that fell into a pit, would you not on the Sabbath day try to get it out? And so we see here that he's saying, this is something good. Wouldn't you want to do something good to help someone, to heal someone? But we see here that they didn't say anything. And this is the unfortunate thing of, not unfortunate thing, but the true thing of pride, is that even if it's right to do, the stubbornness sets in, and no, I will not do that. Because it may be right, but I have to be right. And that's where we need not to be as believers and servants of the Lord, and that we're so focused that this is my way or the highway. Now, there's certain doctrines that I truly believe that's God's way or the highway. I mean, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, one of my boys asked about a certain church down the road. Baptism does not save you. Doing good works does not save you. Their works are fruit of, of being a Christian, but those do not get you to heaven. It's your faith in Jesus Christ. And so in regards to that one, that would be God's way or the highway. Now, we're not talking about little preferences or nitpicky things, but we need to realize that when Christ preached the gospel and he preached himself and preached the doctrines, those were the truth, and there was no other way. And so this was the good way, is what Christ was saying. And this is what the Pharisees said. No, or they didn't say anything. And you also find that uh, even with um, Elijah at Mount Carmel, when he said, choose, you, choose who you're going to serve here. Choose who is God. And they set the sacrifices up. And it says the people answered not a word. And it's sad. Some of them just wanted to see something happen, but others, the stubbornness of their heart. So... Will you pick what's good, or will you pick what's bad? And an example that we find of that, a really telling example, is found in, in Numbers chapter 16. So if you do want to turn there, you may, Numbers chapter 16. Um, if you do remember, um, and as you turn to Numbers 16, so at least you can follow along, the children of Israel obviously um, went through uh, the Red Sea and Sinai Peninsula, headed their way to the Holy Land. And... Here goes the 12 spies that spy out the land. Do we find out that Joshua and Caleb are the only ones that said, hey, this is great land. The other 10 said, no, uh, this is this is flow of milk and honey. Yes, it is plentiful and great, but the giants, it's going to be a hard thing. And so they just committed the people's heart, and they said, hey, let's not go this way. So they all said, nope, we're not going. And they said, why did you take us out of Egypt? Either bring us, take us back, which that wasn't going to happen. Or let us die in the wilderness. And I truly believe God answered that prayer saying, fine, you're all going to die in the wilderness. Um, so we find that that's happening. Then we come to Numbers chapter 16. And it says, Now Kor, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, Dathan, and Abraham, and the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben, took men. Um, so these weren't all Levites. And we'll find that later on when the 250 of them got um, uh, roasted. Um, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together themselves against Moses and against Aaron and said unto him, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. Now, mind you, they just got their punishment. You're going to wander the desert for 40 years because of your unbelief. Because of your complaining, and that's your punishment. But they're all holy, mind you. Um, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And it's always amazing when you do find some stubborn people, um, they do sound religious. They sound higher than you. That's right. um, you're lifting yourself above the congregation of the Lord in doing this. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Um, it was the grace of God for some of those children of Israel that Moses was there. Um, because we find uh, later on in, in this chapter that God pretty much told Moses and Aaron, hey, you two need to separate from the nation here, the whole congregation, because they're following this group of men. 
And he says here, it says, Moses spake unto Korah, and he said unto the company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. And even him who he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. And so this do, take you censors, Korah, and all his company, put fire then in, put incense them in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do service to the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation and to minister unto them. And he hath brought near he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, and the sons of Levi with thee, and seek the priesthood also. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? And so he's saying it's not a small thing that you were separated. Korah, you and your family were separated to do the work of the Lord. Amen. It's not a small thing that this happened to you. Right. And so he's trying to give them a chance here, repent, knock this off. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram and the sons of Eliab, which said, we will not come. And so he's saying, let's have this conversation. They said, we're not even messing with this. We're going to do our own thing. And they, and they mock him. And they say, is it a small thing that thou hast brought us out of the land that floweth milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? It's funny that they got taken out of the land that floweth milk and honey. Um, you were slaves in that land. You were forced to make things for Pharaoh. And that's what you say is, has milk and honey? Um, he says, was it a little thing that this happened to us? To kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that flow of milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Like, we're not going to waste our time. It's, it, this goes back to what Pastor Jim was preaching about and about Absalom uh, and rebellion. They're just completely blind to the truth. The ten spies said, That land is great but the giants are bigger than our God. So they had the land, they rejected the land. So they're reaping the consequences of their decision in rejecting God's promise. And so here they are reaping these problems. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord thou, verse 16, And they and Aaron tomorrow, take every man his censer and put incense in them and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer of 250 censers. Thou also and Aaron, each of you, his censer. We come further down, and this all happened, and it says here in verse 20, The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And we see that Moses and Aaron intervened here. Moses particularly intervened in this and said, And they fell on their face to the Lord and said, O God, the God of spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And so they didn't go to the Lord in anger. They didn't go to the Lord in rebellion. They said, Lord, will all of them pay for this one man? And then God said, separate Korah and his family and these other two men from the congregation. And we find here that that was done. And it says in verse 31, it came to pass as he made an end of speaking, all these words that Moses spoke here, it says that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that have appertained unto Korah and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed among them, and they perished from among the congregation. All Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, and they said, lest the earth swallow up us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And so we see the judgment of God of a, of a group of individuals who decide to go against the authority that was set up. And a lot of times when we read the Old Testament, we think, that's pretty harsh. The ground swallowed a whole family and closed back up. The 250 men that Moses said, if you think you're going to follow God, have your incense. And light it. They got burned up. The two other families, as well, the ground swallowed up. God's serious about who he puts in charge. Because who he puts in charge is a reflection of him. So God's serious that he's the boss. 
And it's interesting here because here we're about to see the true stubbornness of the children of Israel. Because it wasn't years later that they rebelled again. It wasn't weeks later. Verse 41, And on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. I tell you what, when you rebel against God, you just go cuckoo. For lack of better words. They just lost it. You literally watched, you watched Moses say, if, if I'm with God, then we'll see tomorrow what's going to happen. If Korah is with God, you'll see tomorrow. Everyone shows up. You better get away from Korah. The ground opens up and swallows him. And his whole family. 250 people torched. The other two families swallowed up. The next day, you just killed people of God. God's not going to go against his own self. It's, all, it's the same thing with the Pharisees when you're of the devil because you cast out devils. You can just see Christ. <clears throat> if you can see his face, that's just stupid. Why would the devil be against his own? It is just, it's, it's ridiculous, the arguments that take place, and it's sad, the stubbornness of the heart. That the people then, after seeing that, would say, you just destroyed the people of the Lord. In two days, at two occasions here, do we see Moses intervene again. And Moses told Aaron, you better get a censor. We better start praying to God. Because as soon as they said that, a plague began to happen and people started dying. Because God said, you better get away from him again, Moses, because I'm going to kill them all. Because of disobedience. Because of the stubbornness of their heart, the hardness, they would not be tender toward the Lord. But Moses intervened. So two days, twice does he intervene, or we could have seen a different story of the nation of Israel. Young person or older person, who's intervening in your life right now is the question. How far are you going to rebel against God and who is it that's praying for you? A grandma, a granddad, an aunt, an uncle, a parent, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher who's praying for you that, Lord, please intercede and have mercy because they're on the path of just pure stubbornness and they're going to be destroyed. And that's the path that these children of Israel are taking. And Moses intervened and said, Lord, please show your mercy. You promised that this is the people you'll bless. And Lord did have mercy. The plague was stopped. But we see that if we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that there's a reason why this story is read. And why we need to always remember the story of the children of Israel as they wandered the wilderness. It says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For the drink of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither less commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three thousand, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, or as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And so, we need to remember these stories from the wilderness and what the children of Israel did because it's an example for us to look at. Right. It gives particular sins here, lusts that they followed after, another particular sin as well, fornication and idolatry. And you can read that in the, 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 those, that portion of Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus, um, and how they sinned, they got away from the Lord, and how the Lord judged them. 
But it's the same thing even today. God still judges. No, he may not open up the ground above your house, or under your house. He may not open up the ground and swallow your house, but there's other punishments that God does. Right. Uh, when we read about the early church and Ananias and Sapphira, um, they dropped dead for their sin against the Holy Spirit. Um, God works in different ways than we know. And that doesn't mean that every time someone goes through a hard time, oh, they must be sinning. Read the book of Job. That's not always the case. But why are we stubborn? So we come back to here to Mark chapter 3. Now let's bear in mind, Mark chapter 3. He entered again in the synagogue, and there was a man which had a withered hand. And he says this in verse 4. He says, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. So we look here, we see Christ. Remember, Christ is the all-eternal one. This isn't Christ talking to the Jewish people, and this is the first time he saw their hard hearts. We just read in Corinthians that Jesus Christ was tempted in the wilderness. By the children of Israel. We just read that he is the rock that sustained them in the wilderness. Christ was with them here in Numbers chapter 16 when they rebelled and had hard stiff necks. So when Christ looks at the Pharisees here, because he's all the, he is the eternal one, he is not in time, the day before this happened, he was with the children of Israel. He's not, he's not in time. So that's why when he speaks to the Pharisees, it's like you are just a stiff-necked people like your fathers before you. And that's when he talked to the Pharisees. He said to them, when he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they're like, how do you know Abraham? You're young. Abraham's gone and dead because Christ was there. And because he was there, he knows their hearts then. He knows their hearts now. And he was angry. And he was angry. He was upset with them because of the hardness. And look at it. They chose, they chose not to say anything. In other words, you know what? If evil happens to this guy with the withered hand, who cares? We need to be right. And that's what their focus was. They had to be right. And that's pride. And that's that stubbornness that sets in. And that's what sent Korah to his grave. That's what sent the other two men to their grave. That's what sent the 250 other individuals to their grave. And unfortunately, the families reaped the consequences as well. That's what right. sent all the children of Israel above the age of 20 through that wilderness to their grave. They were stubborn. It had to be their way. How often does it have to be our way? And we let God know that. The Lord says, I need you to give this to missions. Uh, Lord, I think this will work. No, I need this amount. Because this is what will take care of it. Um, I'm pretty sure, Lord, and we argue. And if you're sitting there today and you say, I've never argued that. Praise the Lord, you're walking with God great, or you don't get it. Um, because I have some good conversations with the Lord sometimes. Because I see um, uh, boys about to all be teenagers. And I was a teenager once. I'm, still not, I'm not a teenager now, but I still eat a lot. Um, and they eat. Okay? That's food. They have to buy. Food's not getting cheaper. Okay? Um, and I see bills. And I say to the Lord, I don't know if I have this money this year. And you get in an argument with the Lord. Don't be stiff necked. If God's taking care of well, if God's taking care of me this far, he's gonna keep on doing it. Um, read Hudson Taylor, great, great, great biography. Um, that was an individual who said, you know what? Um, God takes care of me here, he'll take care of me here, he'll take care of me in China, he'll take care of me this time, Amen. he'll continue to take care of me, because he's proven it. God's take care of me, he'll take care of me then. You have to swallow the pride, or I should say get rid of it, not swallow it, just get rid of it completely. And that's the stubbornness that sets in, because God wants to do a good work with you. And so we look here at the Pharisees, and what Christ is teaching here, even it says in James 4, 17, you know, for him to know if to do good, do it, but not to him it is sin. And so when you see the opportunity to do what's right, follow the Lord. 
Another portion of scripture here that I want to turn to is Zechariah chapter 11. Um, sorry, chapter 7. And it says here in verse 7, Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets? When Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain. And we continue into verse 8 of chapter 7. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speak of the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment. Show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. And it says here in verse 11, But they refused to hearken, they pulled away the shoulder, they stopped their ears, that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. You ever wanted to talk to someone before, if you're, a, a, if you're a parent, you understand this more, and you try to talk to your child or your teenager, and they turn around, and it's like, oh no, that's not a good idea. And you put your hand on the shoulder to like, turn around, face me, and they do this. That's what the children of Israel are doing to the Lord. It says here, they pulled away the shoulder. Oh no, don't talk to me, Lord. It says they stopped their ears. I've seen that happen in stores with little kids. And they're listening. And they're listening to their parents. Um, you may say, that's kind of comical. That's what the Lord's saying that children of Israel are doing. They're pulling away, and they put their hands over their ears because they're not listening. They don't want to listen. And it says here, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. Um, one translation of this word is diamond in the scripture. I don't know what, what I think the hardest substance, unless and they're in a laboratory today and make something harder, I believe, but it's diamond. They made their heart as the hardest substance that we know of, is what it says. Adamant stone. Because they're stubborn. I hope that no one in this room comes to church with an adamant heart. And saying, you know what? I'm stuck in this way. I don't care what the preacher says. I'm just going to sit here in church and not listen. And when the Holy Spirit's trying to tap me on the shoulder, nope, not, not going to go for that one. Nope. This is where I'm at. You can't even scratch a diamond unless you use another diamond. And so you think, so you have to have something very hard, you have to have something very hard to break something very hard. That's why some people, their stubbornness really leads to destruction. And it's sad to see that. Mm -hmm. right. But that's the stubbornness. Because it says here, they're this way, continue with verse 12, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. And as we continue on, it says, Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, they would not hear. So they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. That happens countless times actually in the scripture, where the children of Israel were told, You need to do this. And they said, No. And they come back to the Lord because of their consequences of their decision. And they say, Lord, help us. And a couple of times, you read the book of Judges, he says, don't cry to your idols. Don't come, Trump, don't come to me. You covered your ears and would not hear, so when you cry, I will not hear. That's a very bad place to be in your life. Right. When God will not hearken to you anymore. And so... Why are we so stubborn? We know what's best for us. And that's to follow the Lord. Now, turn that around. The stubborn person knows what's best for them, and that can't be what God wants. No, it can't be. Remember, his commands are not grievous. The Sabbath was supposed to be a blessing. Not a drudgery. Not a horrible headache that the Pharisees pushed upon people because they had the power that they didn't want to lose. So Christ said, 
And they're not made for that. So praise the Lord, we worship on the first day of the week where he risen. Amen. And not a day where we need to just sit down and rest, but we worship the Lord when he rose. That's why we worship on Sunday. And God established that for us, and you read that in the scripture. But here we do we find in Psalm chapter 75, sorry, Psalm 95, do we get a warning of this? And it falls back again, back to the children of Israel here in the wilderness too. But in Psalm 95, uh, verse 7, it says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, Prove me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. And said, it is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter unto my rest. And so he gives us the warning. Listen to me and follow my word. Because the very first verses of this passage... That's when you listen to God. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise unto, to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. There's such blessing, there's such protection, there's such provision from God when you yield to him. And the stubbornness falls all the way back to that. Read Romans. Are you yielding to God, or are you yielding to the flesh? He only so long will knock on the door of your heart. And he'll knock and try to get your attention the best that he can. Why are we so stubborn? Why? It is amazing the things that keep us stubborn and keep us from doing the will of God. Some of it is quite frankly childish things. It is, it is amazing to me the older I get, and I'm not that old yet, um, so the older I get along, or the longer I'm on this earth, say that. Um, I like to talk it about like like in like in a video game. I'm at level 38. Sounds like it's pretty cool. So level 80. That's that's amazing for the road. That's pretty up there. So um, but anyway, um, think of it that way. But it is amazing. It is amazing the pettiness with stubborn people, and it's just something so. Dumb. To, I would equate it to, I'm not sharing my hot wheel car with you today. Because you picked my favorite one last week. And I'm going to grab my cars and go home. And there's probably people in this room, you've probably done that as a child. You probably said, my ball, I'm going home. This is mine. I did not get my way. Even though you did the foul. You did not get your way. Okay? I'm going home. <clears throat> and I see it with adults. I dare say this, I, I praise the Lord, I don't see it much here at all. I do praise the Lord for that. I do see it, but not a lot. And I praise the Lord for that. But the stubbornness should not exist among believers, and if you're focused on allowing the Lord to direct your life and let your heart be tender toward Him, and not an adamant stone, He can use you greatly. And that's why I said, as the potter, can I not mold you and use you? Because a pot that's already hard is done. It's not going to be used for what God wants it done for, used for. But one that is still tender, one that can still be molded, can still be used and used greatly by the master. And that's why we're here. To be molded and used for the master's use. Yeah. And allow him to dictate what I can do with him. That's why I said, will you let me be like the potter and to mold you? And when something's wrong, take that out easily while it's still tender, as opposed to while it's very hard. 
And that's why he even gives the warning to break up the fallow ground of your heart. Let God do a work in you. And if God does want to do a work in you tonight, you say, you know, there is that one thing I've not let go, I've not let go because I don't want God to take it. Why be stubborn about it? It is amazing the blessings that follow when you just give it to God. Because he wants to bless your life. And that's the lie that Korah believed and these Pharisees that there's no way. My way has to be the right way. And it says there that Christ was angry because of their hard heart. If your heart's, heart is hard, you need to go to the Lord. Ask him to soften it, and he will help you. Sometimes you have to make the first step. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the time that we have tonight to look in it. And I do pray, Lord, that you do work in the hearts tonight, Lord. Uh, if there's anyone in this room tonight who they struggle with being stubborn, they struggle with their pride, they struggle with giving in to you, Lord, I do pray that you do uh, break up the follow ground of the heart, tender their heart so they can speak to you and get it right. Father, and, and we know people who have a stubborn heart. We do. And I do pray we continue to be faithful and praying for them, that the ground will be broken up, Lord. We pray that you continue to convict them, continue to keep on pressing on towards them, and that they, we don't give up on them, Lord. And I do pray you continue to bless them as well. And I do pray that you work 